The Sony a7 III has been my go-to camera for two years. I have done everything you can imagine in Alaska with this camera. But how's it stack up in 2020? That's what we're gonna talk about today. But first, I think we need to find a different location. Almost forgot the camera. Hey, if you don't know me, my name's Jake, and I create content here on YouTube for solo creators on the go. People like me who are out on the go creating small commercial projects, stuff for YouTube. So I do reviews of equipment that makes that process easier and tips and tutorials on how to use that equipment. And this has been my main camera for two years. But is it still worth it in 2020 with all of the other new cameras that have been introduced? I think it is. And it's still gonna be one of my main cameras, even though the a7S III is on the horizon. Before we talk about some of the specifics of the, the strengths of this camera and some of the weaknesses, let's talk about the specs real quick. It has a 24 megapixel full frame sensor. It shoots 4K and 8-bit up to 30 frames a second. It shoots 1080p up to 120 frames a second, which is fantastic. It works very well in low light. It works great in situations like this. It has a weather sealed body with dual SD card slots, which is fantastic. If you're worried about losing footage, you can record to both cards simultaneously. It has the flip up screen in the back so that you can look at different angles. It would have been nice to have a flip out screen like they're putting on some of the new cameras, but there are ways to work around that. Not only is this camera a great choice because of the feature set and what it's capable of producing, but it's also a great choice because of the price. You can buy this camera new for 2000 sometimes $1,800, depending if you find it on sale, which is a phenomenal value for a full frame camera that does everything that this camera does. Let's talk about the photo quality. The photo quality from this camera is great. It's a 24 megapixel sensor, which is big enough to do a lot of stuff with, certainly big enough to do almost anything online, but also be able to print things out at a pretty large size but also the files are fairly easy to work with because they're not gigantic files. And the thing that I like about the 24 megapixel sensor is it performs really well in bright days on stuff like this. It's big enough to do landscape shots. It's big enough to do wildlife shots. It has enough detail to do all of those things, but it also performs very well in low light. I've taken this out to do astrophotography. It's performed fantastically doing astrophotography. It's also performed really well doing light painting and things like that in places where it was pretty much totally devoid of light. Overall, for the last two years, shooting photos with this almost every day, I have been really pleased. I've never had a complaint about the photo quality coming from this camera. It's enough room you can crop in if you need to, but it also gives you plenty of space to work with and plenty of detail to work with when you're working with the photos in post. Another thing that I really like about this camera for in the photo mode is that it has a built-in intervalometer. Now, it didn't have it when it first came out, but Sony added it later in a firmware update. And the fact that I can go out and shoot fantastic time lapses, super high quality because of the 24 megapixel sensor is something that I love. It's great to have kind of an all-in-one machine that you can shoot almost anything you need to shoot with and have the quality be very high quality. And that brings us to the video of this camera. One, I have loved shooting video with this camera because the 4K quality coming out of this camera is excellent. It has been a fantastic video camera for me and I literally have shot video with this almost every single day since I owned it. This is the camera that was always with me every single day to go out in all kinds of different conditions to shoot video with and to shoot photos with, both commercially and for stuff on YouTube. It shoots 120 frames a second in HD. It's a little on the soft side, but it's still very usable and very good, even when I upscale it to 4K, which is pretty impressive. But you can also shoot 4K in 30 or 25, depending on where you are, or 24 frames a second. I generally shoot 24 frames a second just because, you know, I'm civilized. I do shoot 30 frames a second every once in a while if I want to slow it down in post to match a 24 frame per second 
timeline, just to give it a little bit different feeling. But not only that, the low light performance in video mode of this camera is really, really good. I've taken it deep into ice caves where there's no natural light at all, and just illuminated things with a single loom cube. I've taken it out on astrophotography shoots, as I said before, but I've used this to film myself while I was out shooting too. Again, using just a single loom cube. The noise on this camera is much lower than I thought it was gonna be, and the performance in low light has been phenomenal. There's something else that I didn't think I would use nearly as much as I have, but using the APS-C crop mode in this camera for video and photo work, I've used it a lot. Not so much for photo work because you end up with like a 10 megapixel still, which is fine if you're posting it on Instagram and stuff, but for video work, I've used the APS-C mode a ton. Not only because sometimes I do use APS-C lenses on list, like the Sure anamorphic lenses, but also because then you get this 17 to 28 all of a sudden becomes a whole nother focal length when you are using the APS-C mode, which is really great, but you still can film full 4K, full quality 4K video using the APS-C mode, which is really nice if you need just a little bit more reach out of one of your lenses. Another thing that's great about the a7 III, although it's not the best, is it does have in-body image stabilization. So it helps you out when you're trying to shoot in lower light with photos quite a bit. And it helps you out to a certain extent with video. This is an example of handheld with a Sony a7 III using just the camera and the IBIS in the camera, the in-body image stabilization. As you can see, it's not the best, but on wider angle lenses, it does help. Um, it definitely helps. It's just, it's definitely not like comparable to what else is out there in other cameras on the market. But in a pinch, if you can hold it sort of steady, it does work. Or put it on a gimbal and use it as a gimbal camera, which the a7 III works great as a gimbal camera because it's fairly small, lightweight, and there's some really good lightweight lenses available from Tamron and others that work fantastic as a gimbal camera setup. And we can't talk about video without talking about audio because audio is at least half of video. The audio preamps in the Sony were very good, very usable, very low noise floor. And when you pair them with something like this, which has pretty much been my shooting rig, the DDD3 Pro that has a preamp built in, uh, going into the Sony, you get really good, clean audio. I also pair this sometimes with the Rode Wireless Go, which is what I'm using right now. And I've always had very good, very clean audio, which is super important when you're working with video. You wanna be able to get good audio. The one weak point of this camera, I would say, is the audio mic jack, which I did have break on me a couple weeks ago after two full years of using it every single day. And uh, so I did send it off to get fixed. But um, honestly, I'm not that easy on my equipment. Alaska is definitely not that easy on my equipment. And so if that's the only thing that's broken so far at everything I've done with this camera, that's pretty impressive. And that brings us to durability. Like I said, I've used this camera every single day for two years. It's been in my camera bag, it's been out of my camera bag. I've had it in rain, I've had it out in locations like this. I've had it out in locations like this at 22 below zero. I've had it out in places at five or 10 below zero. And it has performed flawlessly for me every single time I've pulled it out. It's been an incredible workhorse. And it's been a camera that I have just learned to trust and pull out of my bag, take with me every time. Something else that's great about this camera is the battery life. I can go on an all day shoot and take two batteries with me and not worry at all about running out of battery life because the battery in this camera lasts a long time. I can probably take about a thousand photos. I have done um, almost, six hours of interviews on two batteries and it has worked perfectly. Another thing that I've really enjoyed about this camera is the, the ability to customize all of the custom buttons. I almost don't even go into the Sony, Sony menu anymore except for when I need to format an SD card just because I've got the custom buttons pretty much programmed to do everything I need. And the fact that there's two memory slots, so I have one set to 4K24, I have one set to 1080p at 120 frames a second, and then the regular video mode I have set at 4K 30 so that I can shoot that if I need to. And then anytime I'm shooting photos, it's simply easy just to switch to the manual mode and I can shoot photos and easily switch right back to video mode in a matter of seconds. And while we're talking about video features, uh, even photo features, the autofocus system on the a7 III is fantastic. It has face tracking, it has eye detection, uh, in photo mode, so when you're shooting photos, portraits, which I've done a lot of portraits, corporate headshots and other types of portraits, it always locks onto the eye really quickly, really well, and takes fantastic portraits. Face tracking in video mode is excellent, especially if you're filming yourself and you wanna know that you're getting your face in focus, it works very well. And even down into fairly low light with this camera, it will detect my face and lock onto my face 
and focus on it. One of the downsides is that if you plug an HDMI cable into this, like if you're streaming or, or using an external monitor as face tracking stops working. However, even without face tracking working, the camera does do a good job of focusing on the correct item. It's just not quite as good or as reliable as when you have face tracking on. The auto ISO feature on this camera, in other words, I do everything manually, set the aperture, I set the shutter speed, and then I leave the, the ISO performance on auto most of the time because the camera does a really good job of picking the correct ISO for the moment and exposing the scene properly. The only times where it's had a hard time is in a situation like this where there's an extremely strong backlight extremely bright surroundings or something like that and I'm wanting to expose more for my face that's the times when I generally have to set the ISO myself so on the downsides the mic jack is the weakest part of this you do need to be careful like when I put it in and take it out of my bag I always have the the mic unplugged and the cover on just because I don't want to break it again. Another thing that I don't like, but they fixed in later iterations, and I assume they'll fix on the a7 r4 whenever that comes out, is these little flippy things. They just kind of get in the way and they're a little bit annoying, but mine are still all on there. Another downside that is not a huge deal, but it is a little bit of a bummer, is that they didn't use a super high resolution screen. So the screen back here is kind of low resolution. It's a little hard to tell sometimes if you've got things in perfect focus, if you're shooting in manual focus, and it's just not quite as high resolution as I would like to see, but it is usable and it does work. And the same thing kind of goes with the EVF. The EVF is better than the screen is, but it's still not super high resolution like something on the A7R series. One more downside is if you're coming from Canon or Nikon, some of those companies, their menu systems are really well done, really well laid out. The menu system in this is not as well done and not as well laid out. Now, it is very detailed and you can do a lot with it, but finding your way around takes some time to learn. And the fact that this isn't a touchscreen makes it a little bit harder, especially if you're coming from another system. After 20 years of shooting photos and video and doing production stuff, this has been one of my favorite combinations of anything I have ever owned. Yes, I'm looking forward to the A7S III because that is a very good video camera with a little bit of photo features, but for a camera that does both photo and video, this has been one of the best things that I've ever invested in for my business because this has been the camera that has shot everything that I've done for my business over the last few years. If you want to learn more about lenses or microphones that work really well with the a7 III, I put together a playlist right here. I'll see you in one of those videos. If you've got questions, ask me in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them. Or join me on my live stream Wednesday nights, 4 p.m. Alaska time or 8 p.m. Eastern. I'll see you again soon in the next video. Cheers.